would like to welcome everyone to the webinar series of the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, CSIAC. Today's presentation is entitled Cyber Deconflicted, Understanding the Layers of Cyberspace. My name is Steve Warzala. I'm the CSIAC Outreach Manager. A few administrative notes before we begin. Questions may be asked at any time during the presentation by utilizing the chat function. And time permitting, your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Uh, today's briefing slides will be posted on Techpedia within a couple days. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our sponsor, the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC. The funding that DTIC provides enables CSIAC to conduct these webinars. My pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's webinar, Mr. Michael Woodenberg. He's a systems engineer conducting operations research for Lockheed Martin. Michael is the research lead for autonomy, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. He is working on architecting and designing autonomous systems. Michael recently was managed the cyber, electronic warfare, and directed energy R&D portfolio, advancing advanced non-kinetic systems to the DOD customer. He also led a systems engineering team providing process optimization across the enterprise in model-based systems engineering, digital twin, and digital transformation. I will now turn the presentation over to Mr. Woodenberg. Good afternoon, Mike. The floor is now yours. Thank you. Good morning. So good morning to everybody, I, or I guess it's afternoon on the East Coast. I'm still readjusting from my trip to Tucson. Um, yeah, so today what I wanted to share with you is um, a lot of lessons learned, bumps and bruises, um, insights and knowledge that I've gleaned from the practitioners across the, uh, the cyber domain. Um, the, really the genesis of this presentation was trying to be able to communicate to both practitioners and especially stakeholders the full I would say, gamut of what is cyber. And part of the problem was, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit, is the number of people who were claiming to be cyber and trying to figure out what was their unique perspective on that, how did that support the whole engagement within it, and how do we make sure that we are actually um, really defending our space the way that we should from that holistic systems approach. So the problem space, it's a perfect prefix. I mean, back in 1996, the New York Magazine identified that nobody has any idea what it means. It can be grafted on any old word and make it seem new and cool, therefore strange and spooky. And you see this with a lot of the buzzwords. I have a similar beef with data science when it comes to you know, AI. And I said before, there's no use being jealous when you've already lost. I had, a, uh, I had a fellow once tell me that he was creating AI-enabled robots um, for data analysis, and it basically ended up that he was coding decently expert system macros in Excel. So cyber has a similar sort of a problem because it can be aside, applied so broadly to really virtually encapsulate anything in the electronic domain. Um, cybersecurity has an equally challenging definition uh, because a lot of the things that we currently do in cybersecurity also fall under different uh, organizations like physical security, um, IT security, information assurance, and there's a great example coming up on information assurance being rebranded. Um, and, and one way to think about it was cybersecurity is often most aptly described as digital security. That kind of helps scope that one a little bit. But starting out, so uh, quote from Eisenhower, whenever I run into a problem I can't solve, I always make it bigger. I can never solve it by trying to make it smaller, but if I make it big enough, I can begin to see the outlines of a solution. This is a great quote that I found for the, the, my frustration with the system. So many people end up narrowing it down to their little hidey hole and trying to say that they are encapsulating cyber. Um, on the flip side, I just break it out bigger and try to understand the, the larger implications of this. If I think it doesn't fit, I stretch to find out how it would, and then only if it doesn't fit under that would I discard some of the insight. So that's kind of the tempo and tenor of this uh, of this presentation. Look wide to understand. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to go distill the DOD interpretation on cyberspace. This was some work that a team of mine and I did last year on, uh, at Raytheon. Understand cyberspace, the different layers. Articulate the application of cyber to products and infrastructure. There's a unique uh, idiosyncrasy there. Deconflict the roles within cyberspace. Discuss traditional tactics and non-traditional train. This was a presentation I gave at the Moore's Military Operations Research Society annual symposium, um, talking about how we tried to make cyber into something new when in reality there's a lot we can currently do about it. Then looking at cybersecurity layers, understanding from understanding the tactics, how do we do the cybersecurity? And then some insight that we gleaned just this last uh, couple weeks uh, back in October at the Moore's Cyber Wargaming and Analytics Workshop of how to model and simulate and wargame within the cyber domain and those relationships. So kicking off and getting started, looking at the DOD environment and distilling the DOD position. So the problem is there's multiple definitions from the critical DOD stakeholders. Um, you can just look at each group, each of the nine major, and then we pulled a dictionary definition as a backdrop um, to try to understand what people are saying when they say cyber. Um, with each one having their own definition, there's a ton of different guidances that go in with this. All these different guidances start to change the direction of how we end up viewing these perspectives. Things like information assurance in 2014 adopts the term cybersecurity um, to be used throughout the DOD instead of information assurance. So now you have a uh, historically established and understood moniker, information assurance, now being appended with cybersecurity under which a lot of other things are currently um, pinned as cybersecurity. So a little bit of extra mud in that water. Different definitions, just a couple examples from this, cyberspace, another one for cyberspace, a third one for cyberspace, and then trying to do the cybersecurity and what a, what a threat actually is. This is the environment that we analyze doing some, um, some uh, taxonomic analysis and then looking at the semantic ontology of this. All these different definitions and uh, go to the C CSI Act is how to build and operate a trusted dota. And this is kind of a painful chart to look at because when you look at all of these different policies and procedures, you can see how different groups, different people would take different perspectives on each of this. So this is the environment that the DOD currently has. So as a research and development program manager, how do I address and handle and develop products that meet the majority of what the customer wants? And that goes into the study. This, this chart explains kind of the taxonomic structure that we developed. We looked for different cyber elements. What are these things talking about? What are the critical elements and where do they actually be found within the vision, the missions, and the definitional statements that the DOD published? We took these, we consolidated them. This was the semantic ontology, trying to find out where their where their context allowed them or, or put that put that together. And that came up with this consolidated DOD cyber definition. All organizational actions required to maximize freedom maneuver, protect systems from compromise of mission profiles to fulfill operational needs, to optimize risk management, authorize access to the security availability, integrity of information, communications architectures, systems, computers, and networks in support of the DOD, the defense industrial base, and or coalition partners, and then to deny the same to our adversaries. And, uh, same with the DOD vision and the DOD mission. This basically gave us a target to go after. Problem is, it still ends up being pretty broad. However, at least we now had a, a way to address the focus areas for the majority of our DOD customer. So with that kind of, let's just call it the cornerstone of the, of the situation, um, we're going to get into the understanding cyberspace uh, kind of looking at that complex system. So the joint publication 312 describes cyberspace. Um, well, let me back up super quick. The first bullet there is kind of the electronic interconnectedness and data transfer space between and within technology systems. It's big. I mean, it's anything that you start plugging together at everything. And from my perspective, working at Raytheon Missile Systems or even here at Lockheed and Missiles and Fire Control, 
is we develop edge systems on the Doden. We have missiles that plug into, you know, test equipment that plugs into networks that plugs into, um, but those interconnectedness and transfer space gives a cyber vulnerability to those weapons and or from those weapons into the Doden. So understanding that encapsulation, then we can look at the, the layers of cyberspace. Um, the DOD identifies them as having physical, which is like your IT devices and infrastructure and the physical domain. Um, that's pretty easy. That's, you know, your routers, your computers, your actual physical systems. The logical is the elements of the network that allow things to um, progress through. Those are like your programs, your basically your program space is what that is, your application and program space, and then your persona. The persona layer is the users on that system and their relationship to one another. And that is a critical, when you talk about like information operations within cyberspace or you talk about uh, different security types, the persona layer is an, a highly important layer to, to make sure we pay attention to, especially when it comes to how we behave with systems, which we'll get into a little later with modeling simulations and war games. So, from the cyber wargaming and analytics workshop that we had a couple weeks ago, there was an interesting um, additional perspective that came in. So we had the layers of physical, logical, and persona, but then we have engagements in cyberspace, which go from discrete, like explicit actions and effects, to persistent, which is like long-term intel, tech development, things of that nature. And we'd have these people that they're like, oh, I want a cyber effect. I want this effect in this thing. And then you have people saying, well, you know, but that, that effect would take 10 years to, to, to code in. And so what happens when you look at this, you start to see the, the blending of the layers, where the physical and logical and the discrete in this area um, are like your cyber weapons or effects, your physical and logical and your persistent. This is more mapping cyber terrain, some of your zero day effects, coding, um, looking for long term penetration. It's more the persistent application is more akin to like military intelligence than it is to a discrete event. Military intelligence is a persistent, long term, um, continuous activity like the NSA or, or military intelligence or CIA type activities. Um, they do have discrete activities, but for the most part, a lot of it is persistent. And then when you start getting into persona, you start looking at, you know, persona and discrete is kind of your reactions, deceptions, or phishing. And then your persona and persistent is more like your long-term information operations, intelligence, and counterintelligence activity. Um, and if you have any questions thus far, I'm kind of keeping an eye out on the list. Um, feel free to ask, and I can jump back. Otherwise, we'll, I'll kind of grab them at the end. So, But again, one of the interesting things was we had groups that were looking at um, – at cyber, and everyone agreed with the cyber layers, but then you found out that they were not recognizing one group was talking about discrete, and the next group was talking about persistent based cyber. It was really interesting as a way to make sure we encapsulate the full dimensions of cyber. Now, understanding that, then there was an interesting finding that we had about cyber and products versus cyber and infrastructure. Cyber and products are things like the uh, a lot of the NIST or the RIMF or RMF or all these other controls that go in there focus um, on both in some ways. But products are things that we create and pass on to a customer. And they get ingested and may get implemented in their network, but they're out of the contractor network. Whereas cyber and infrastructure are those things which companies use to produce products and do not pass on to a customer. So. For the sake of, I'll, I'll go back to Lockheed, is we have our infrastructure, which has its own players and actors and, and analysis, and that infrastructure creates products, which has its own actors and policies and oversight and analysis. Um, and a lot of times, this, this chart came out because I'd be going to a VP, this was back at Raytheon actually, but I'd be going to a VP and I'd be like, well, let's talk about cyber research and development. And they'd be like, well, hold on a second, I thought cyber was IT. You're like, oh, okay. How do you how do you back that one up and and get them to or you know, oh, I've already got a cyber guy. You know, it's the systems. It's the anti tamper systems engineer down there. You're like, oh, like okay. Try and back it back up. 
get the full picture back going. So we found that describing delineating cyber products versus cyber infrastructure made sure that you looked at those vulnerabilities because so many times we'd have a, a weapon system that's there, everyone's so comfortable that it's completely and utterly you know, cyber safe. And then you find out that the test equipment has highly sensitive calibrated technologies that go out to an unsecured facility and we don't know if they actually come back right. So the test equipment could actually be cyber vulnerable, which could actually throw off the entire weapon system, even though the weapon system is cyber vulnerable because you're testing it to the wrong parameters. So understanding the difference between those two enabled a lot of my stakeholders to look at the full scope of the implications. So kind of wrapping this up, the uh, as the technologies become more interconnected, you're going to get more attack surfaces going to get more implications to these systems, collaborative weapons, network center, sen networked sensors, remote kill chains, um, and especially new connections to legacy equipment. Things were the that were never designed to be connected in the first place that now are pose some very unique threats. And then they are also connecting to links that uh, that uh, of security measures that were recognized outside of, of cyber, like information assurance, anti-tamper, your supply chain measures, and your physical security. For decades, or I mean, even over 100 years, you've had to consider these different activities here within your products um, without any digital interconnection space. But now, cyber blends these together a little bit. And then really cyberspace interconnections just improve accessibility to missile systems as technology links um, or any system links more systems together. So understanding that we're not, we're not getting any simpler at this point in time, so to be, pay attention to those vectors. So trying to break down, so going back to physical, logical, and persona, the understanding of the, uh, the discrete versus persistent, the understanding of the application of product to infrastructure, and then the understanding that this space is going to continue to develop as we go. Um, I want to shift a little bit and talk about the cyber roles, understanding who works in these environments. So this was a, a chart I put together to just try and describe, I broke it down to a quad chart where you have your infrastructure and your product lines, and then requirements focused, or you know, kind of lets your controls focused, it's reactive to your discriminator focused, which I'll, I'll categorize as proactive your discriminator development. So where I worked um, back at Raytheon was in the offensive and defensive cyber R&D. So we we're working on the fusion of directed energy and cyber, and then currently kind of working on autonomous sentinel systems, things like that. Then you have system security engineering. They have a subset of anti-tamper, cybersecurity engineering, software assurance, supply chain security that falls into a heavily requirements space, but cross from product into infrastructure, or at least should. Um, and then test engineering, again, heavily focused on infrastructure, but it has a, uh, it does have an effect on the product. And then IT security or IT cyber. Now, the point of this chart is to say this was uh, really kind of in reaction to people saying, oh, so-and-so is, you know, Mr. Cyber, so-and-so is Mrs. Cyber. You know, they're the ones that, they're the cyber expert. And you're like, oh, like they are focused on IT or they're focused on anti-tamper. They're focused, even myself, I would never call myself Mr. R or Mr. Uh, cyber because I was only focusing on one quadrant out of four. So this really helps people understand the full scope of who actually plays in this realm. So this actually comes from the Department of Defense, um, which is a good description of how these things work, like system security engineering, including these different activities under system security engineering. Um, and then again, the, the definitions of these, you know, cybersecurity, hardware assurance, software assurance. A lot of these activities existed long before um, let's just say the interconnectedness and cybersecurity like I mentioned before, and they're being reconfigured under the cyber domain. So people who may not have had an explicit role in that or may not recognize their explicit role in that, now are getting to be tight partners in this space. From my systems engineering perspective, it's important to, to make sure they're all talking the same playbook when it comes to cyberspace.
All right. Are there any questions so far? All right. What we're going to transition to right now, so we've kind of covered the background, we've covered, we we provided the distilled definition um, from the DOD. If you're going to, to take a one direction, hit the majority of it, what would that be? Uh, we looked at cybersecurity or cyber, cyberspace from the, the layers aspect with the discrete versus persistent. Took a look at the roles. Um, now, this is actually a, was an interesting finding for me, was hearing people talk about all these different tactics and all these different things. And you're, I'm listening to them, I'm prior service Army, um, field artillery officer from 2005 to 2011. And I'm listening to these people. I'm like, man, this sounds a lot like an Army operation. So is this cyber or not? An adversary is planning to attack a piece of critical infrastructure. They conduct reconnaissance, find the vulnerabilities, probe the defenses, identify their penetration point. Once they breach, they maintain stealth and work their way to a vulnerable system. At the exploitation point, their weapon is deployed, and they exfiltrate while covering their tactics. The defender is not idly sitting by. They're conducting area and perimeter surveillance. They have defensive mechanisms in place and work to fight the threat back off the objective. What do you think? Cyber or not cyber? Could be both. Replace the units, add the technology systems, encapsulate areas, operations as networks, replace soldiers with system administrators, civilians with users. But when the terrain changes, the tactics by and large remain the same. There's dynamic assault and defense, there's uh, adaptable response, ebb and flow, and covert and overt tactics. So the reason I bring this up is if we believe they're collectively new, we fail to recognize how many tools we already have to combat them. And something that was near and dear to my heart was when I deployed to Iraq in 2007 was the IED phenomena. Um, IEDs were new, not new. Um, when, when I first got in, it was this newest problem. And everything that, that they needed to solve this problem was a technology solution. They were gonna put these heat sensors on the front, they had jammers, they had rollers, they had all this different stuff to mitigate an IED. But really what they ended up doing, by and large, is causing them to blow up not on target. The enemy just changed their tactics and we continued to get hit. But we have manuals that go back to World War I on how to create IEDs, double stacked landmines, you know, daisy chained artillery rounds, all these other things. But we forgot about it. Um, Really, what an IED is, is the mass casualty effector in a classic ambush. So if you're familiar with the ambush, you set up your, your activity, you know, find a choke point, find a spot where they, they're going to run over the, the area, put a claymore or some other mass cal effector, and then detonate it. And then either exploit the situation or make your escape. Well, that's what they were doing in Iraq. So I got to Mosul and... Uh, was going out on missions, was a little worried about IEDs. Had the epiphany, was talking to some other friends, we were talking about this, and uh, we decided that instead of looking for IEDs, we would look for ambush locations. Because we have battle drills for how to handle the ambush. But if you follow the classic ambush tactics, you can identify them. And so we'd look around, we'd find the choke points, we'd find the, you know, the natural lines of drift, we'd find the places we would set up IEDs. And by doing that, we found 25 of them and never got blown up. But we weren't looking for IEDs. We were looking for ambush locations, which kept us out of a bunch of other pickles as well, where they weren't going to use a, an IED, but they were going to use small arms fire on these type of ambush things. But it was interesting because it goes back to a classic situation. And so cyber can suffer from that very quickly. If we aren't careful of understanding that so many of the tactics that are being used in information operations or in classic cyber infiltration and manipulation and theft emulate a lot of what we currently would do in a physical point, um, there's humans running these things by and large, and that helps us understand how they're going to look at it and allows us to better defend our, uh, or provide security for that system. So that gets into a nice uh, segue here for defending cyberspace. Um, 
if we understand, if we consider reconsider the implications of cyber attacks, we can look at the layers of cybersecurity and the simulations to traditional tactics. Look at the commonality, leverage more of the lessons learned, and recognize the pra the patterns. Um, if I was going to set up a cyber response system, I'd be looking at battle drills, TTPs, you know, your ISR capabilities and your troop leading procedures. I'd apply them um, just immediately for how I would respond to it. I don't think I would treat the, the space substantially different than I would treat a battle room um, for a physical operation. So cybersecurity. So this is, um, this is gonna be some uh, new information a little bit, so I'll, I'll try to articulate this. So there's two layers of cybersecurity that almost everybody recognizes, and that's hardening, with this physical controls like anti-tamper firewalls, software blocks, things like that. And then there's resiliency, which is the ability to fight through an attack um, where you have the prepare, protect, detect, respond, and recover cycle. These are, these are basically the two levels that we're looking at. The third level that I'm introducing is anti-fragility. This is based off Nassim Tlaib's book um, called Anti-Fragile. And anti-fragile is like de designing a system I'll give a couple examples that are anti-fragile. The first one is your immune system. Your immune system is anti-fragile because if you hit it and you and you didn't expose it to anything, it would you would die in short order if once exposed. Your immune system gets better through exposures. The whole vaccination theory. Uh, the second thing is your muscle system is an anti-fragile system because you need to lift heavier and heavier weights. You actually need to do micro tears in your muscles in order to cause them to build up bigger. And the third is actually your brain. Your brain is anti-fragile because as it gets exposed, this thing is constantly learning, constantly rewiring, and constantly adapting to the new stimuli and systems. So imagine now designing a, 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 a cyber system that's anti-fragile, something that isn't trying to avoid threats. It's trying to, or it's willing to entertain threats. Um, you know, take a, you know, a honey pot or a honey, honey net and continue to expand it where you have dynamic, um, dynamic network creation and you can keep your enemy busy poking through your system. You can even feed it information, find out where it pops up. You can do counterintelligence. But what you're doing is you're keeping them busy in a system that's taking them time, money, and energy to exploit, and it's going nowhere. So you're creating a problem that ends up being an NP hard problem, computationally intensive, because they don't know if they can trust um, any network that they get into. Uh, a great example of this is a study that I did a few years ago, which is where is the most or the safest place to store highly classified data? And the answer is unencrypted on the open web because no one's looking for it out there. And even if they find it, the probability from a human psychological standpoint that they actually trust that it's actually that important and that is, is very low. Um, because one of the interesting things is that's an anti-fragile solution. The problem is our hardened solution where we have skiffs and we have safes and we have all these access points and control points and everything else that exists is that if you don't want me to have the data that badly. Your system is fragile, and I can actually, by poking it, I can crack it and cause you to deny yourself access to your own system. So the point of this is we've got hardening and resilience that, that we know and we understand, but anti-fragility is really where I think the next wave of how we design these things are going to go. Um, anti-fragile uh, supply chains. Imagine if I don't need a trusted supplier anymore. I don't have to have a single trusted foundry for a chip. I can ingest any chip. Well, now what's the probability, just from a computational standpoint, that an enemy is going to be able to affect 10 million chips, of which I take 1,000, versus 1,000 chips from one supplier in a dedicated supply chain? Um, again, the, the second option of the trusted foundry is hard. The first option of the selecting from many is anti-fragile but then designing the system in a way that it can actually gracefully degrade versus fail, where it would be designed more like a self-healing mesh network, where as nodes fall out or get corrupted, you can reroute data, and you can still maintain a degree of capability as you execute. 
So the point of that is the introduction of anti-fragile to the hardening and resiliency is that when you apply those across the physical, logical, and personal layers, cybersecurity is not at any one point, but layered through all of those different considerations. Um, human actors are as critical a player in this system as computing assets, and it's blended across mission life cycles, business processes, product development life cycles, and supply chain layers. So understanding that you have a minimum of nine different intersecting points on this, um, and more than likely gradients between them. And then remember going back and looking at physical, logical, persona implications across discrete and persistent cyber. You now start to have a good holistic view of how you would provide an understanding to your, your, your teams on cyberspace, as well as how you would start to consider cybersecurity. Because as you start to go down, this starts to expand um, throughout the product development lifecycle and across the entire supply chain. So how do you handle this amount of, let's just say, chaos potentially in the lower end of your supply chain um, if you're trying to make it hardened? You end up making your supply chain so fragile, the, the slight variation or perturbation in your lower level causes you to literally lose control at the top very quickly from a production environment. I'm speaking as from my experience at uh, defense contractors, we are already struggling at times to make production rates. Um, it would not take much to crash a system by introducing a perturbation in a supplier based on these the hardening and resiliency functions. All right. Um, so far, no questions, so I'll continue to modeling and simulation and wargaming. This is really a uh, new material that we added uh, just recently based on the cyber wargaming activity. And, um, and one of the interesting things was, so this was the Military Operations Research Society, um, uh, what was it, Cyber Wargaming and Analytics Workshop. So you had Practitioners from across the DOD and within the um, actually academia and defense contractors like Lockheed and Raytheon and different individual, um, even small business owners and groups that were participating in this activity. So what was interesting is we actually had it broken into two working groups. One was working group one, which was focused on wargaming. And the other was working with group two, which basically focused on analytics and modeling and simulations. Well, the interesting thing was there was this, this is where like discrete versus uh, persistent came in. And this is where there was discussion on whether or not, well, do we need war gaming if we can do appropriate modeling or people come out and say, hey, I have this great model. It does this well. And the war gamers or other modelers would look at it and go, yeah, but you're missing this element, that element and the other element you know, that that data is no longer valid. So what we identified was that you have modeling and simulations which work well for the physical and logical layers and influence your trade space, design considerations, requirements. And then you have your wargaming, which works really well in the persona or cognitive layer, which affects tactics, techniques, and procedures, training, and personnel. Now, both of those, there's an overlap here. It's not one or the other, but which volume of which one or the other, how do you blend those together to get your insights and reports and analysis. So as you can see over here on the left, um, modeling simulation works well defined and discrete uh, versus wargaming works well in ambiguous and human dependent data capture. Also works well to identify and extract human behaviors and responses. So what that looks like going back to the physical logical persona layers across the discrete and persistent is that when we apply the modeling simulations and wargaming uh, construct, physical, logical, and and uh, and physical, logical, and heavily discrete work well with uh, modeling and simulations, and even some degree persistent, not quite as well as discrete. Um, and then wargaming works well for your persona layer, specifically on your discrete and your persistent activities. So that's really kind of interesting to see how those broke down and how I can model my physical and logical, but I probably need to use that model in a war game to really fundamentally understand how people react. 
So, for instance, a great finding that we had was in that resiliency, and I'll jump back a couple slides to this one. In the resiliency, prepare, protect, detect, respond, and recover, if I'm only focusing on the physical and logical, I can have a computer system that gets attacked, detects that attack, responds to that attack, and recovers from that attack. And it causes a little blip in the system maybe, but you know, it, it alerts, says, hey, I got, I got poked. Well, the problem is if you don't take into account, account the persona layer in that detect, respond, and, re and especially recovery, I may have a system that physically and logically recovered. I have a computer system that is back and working, and I have humans who refuse to use it because you have to be able to take into account all these different dimensions. So when you're looking at modeling this or understanding how humans are going to react to it, looking beyond just the physical and logical and the persona and understanding that what you could model appropriately versus what you can war game appropriately was a very valuable finding for how we, we in the uh, Moore's community, as well as what the work I'm doing here at Lockheed, um, how, to, how to go forward with that. So to kind of wrap things up here, um, really fundamentally cyber is a wicked problem. Um, the problems are unique, not totally. You know, traditional tactics on non-traditional terrain. There's no clear definition, but we can kind of distill one out that kind of gives us a, a decent shot in that area. It is multi-causal, multi-scalar, and interconnected. That one is understanding then the layers, the physical, logical persona, discrete, persistent, um, hardening, resilience, and anti-fragility, these different considerations that go into it. You do have multiple stakeholders, and part of that is understanding, like we talked about the roles and responsibilities, who is doing what and where, how they play, what their roles are, what their strengths are, what they need to bring in. So by understanding that larger space, we can start to handle those multiple stakeholders better. Solutions aren't right or wrong, but better or worse. And this is going to be true, I think, for anything where you start adding in uh, even in the military, there is no right or wrong tactic. There is no right or wrong strategy. It's just better or worse. Um, so we're in a very similar boat on that one, which is at least we have lessons learned that we can harvest from those activities. And then the problems are never completely solved. There will always be risk inherent with this. There will always be the inability to fundamentally and completely control the situation. But I think it's a misnomer to suggest we can, which goes into the concept of anti-fragility. If we can never completely solve the problems, then I should start designing my systems to be anti-fragile, whereby I welcome the probes that are the problem so I can learn from them and adapt to them before they become a serious malady. So then, really fundamentally, understanding cyberspace in these terms really enables us to do better solutions across the domain. Um, and I guess I kind of captured this in the last one, but understanding, going back to the beginning, understanding the DOD interpretation, the layers, the difference between product and infrastructure, recognizing that tactics aren't really so new, um, the layered cybersecurity and differentiating the application of modeling and simulation of war game, it really helps us kind of break these systems down better. And that, pending any questions, is my presentation on, on uh, deconflicting cyber. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael. That was uh, that was very interesting. The uh, you know the perspective that you you provided. Uh, yeah, I think it was uh, you know you, it's a big it's a you know, it's a big puzzle. You know, and I think a lot of times people you know do get into the habit at at you know looking just at the one little piece of the puzzle that they that they've been given, and uh, you know all, all those various elements. Uh, you know, their intersections, uh, you know, the different, uh, you know, roles, whether it's an IT enterprise versus the, you know, product, the weapon system. Um, yeah, you know, so when you when you showed that quote by uh, Eisenhower about, you know, when he gets a problem he couldn't solve, he made it bigger. That sounds kind of counterintuitive, but, uh, you know, as you, as you, uh, you know, did that kind of, you know, pull back and, 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 you know, see the whole, see the bigger picture, you know, then, then I think you can start to see where the problems are or how, 
you know, the different elements kind of, you know, the crossover and how they intersect and, uh, you know, affect each other. So, um, yeah, fasc- fascinating, fascinating stuff. So we do have uh, a one one question that's uh, come in from our from our audience, and let me uh, run that by you. Um, and it's uh, having to do with the uh, your you talked about the IED versus ambush, and the individuals interested on. Uh, what your thoughts are on the insurgency, counterinsurgency versus communications, countercommunications insurgency uh, as it pertains in the uh, modern cyber environment? Yeah, it's a great question. So, again, I'd, I'd go back and say, you know, so let me, let me step back a, a little bit on this one. Something that I've learned as a systems engineer is that we spend so much time in general convincing ourselves why things are different versus why they're the same. And so you know, when I go into something, my first inclination is I don't really know a lot about, let's just take autonomous systems. When I came in, it wasn't, I, I was aware, somewhat familiar, hadn't really studied it too much. But then I started analyzing the behaviors of the way people were talking about autonomous systems. What were they describing? What were their hiccups? What were everything else? The interesting thing is I have a very similar brief to this as to uh, for autonomy as I do this because the work I did on this over the last several years gave me a background for understanding where their hiccups were in autonomy. You had a lot of definitional problems. You had a lot of philosophical, you know, oh, this is, you know, autonomous system has to be able to do this, 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 or this. Um, it's another buzzword, so people wanted to apply it. it. Sounds cool, so, you know, people are in, incentivized to add it to their, to their, um, uh, what do you call it, to their list of credentials. But in the end, um, everyone's kind of hunkering down around the little piece of the puzzle that they know. So to give an, so the example of what was similar is a lot of what I learned about the situ, the situation on cyber directly applied to to autonomy. So I had a couple of my team members do like we did the the um, literature review for the cyber definition. Um, basically, we just picked that up and said, "Hey, I want you to do the same thing here, but I want you to do it on autonomous systems and help us understand if we're going to shoot towards something that's an autonomous system. What are our customers saying that is?" And it came up with a really interesting insight that uh, is highly applicable on that. So kind of back to that point for the insurgency, counterinsurgency, communications, countercommunications, um, especially communications, countercommunications, you're talking, you're talking um, information operations. And we've known information operations forever. I think one of my, my favorite story is uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. And in that, Edward Dantes, or the Count, um, injects a middleman attack using, they had these um, big, they looked like windmill things with these big flags on them, and they signal from London to to Paris, you know, different stock market sort of things. Well, Edward Dantes or Edmund Dantes gets in there and pays off one of the operators, changes the message, so it looks like something went wrong up in London, stock market in Paris crashes, and he basically um, puts into poverty one of his his arc rivals. Um, So we've been dealing with that sort of a situation for a long time. So how do you get error correction there? How do you get recovery in this? How do you mitigate those sorts of things? The pattern exists for way back in history. It's just we have a slightly different uh, uh, domain, faster accessibility, more accessibility to get into these systems, um, lower barrier to entry, if you will. So I think there's a lot of commonality on that, a lot of similar behaviors, because we're dealing with the persona layer. So, Kelly, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, and I think the uh, yeah, I, I think that's interesting too. As you you know, you were going through your presentation, as you you know, you talked about you know looking at the ambush, you know, from you know back in uh, World War II, or and uh, you know being able to take the you know the knowledge, the lessons learned, you know, from that from that physical. Uh, experience and then parlay it over, you know, and apply it to the cyber. Uh, you know, I think I think that's uh, a, you know great use to to show the you know the di- different domains, but how you can relate them and 
and gain valuable information and uh, and apply it from one to another. So that's uh, that's very uh, yeah very very good uh, technique there. So yeah, I think the uh, the interesting thing, kind of the just a uh, the genesis of this whole this whole presentation was realizing when I walked into a, a meeting with cyber practitioners, I'd have to ask, you know, first off, which 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 element, like describe what are you what are you doing, and then second, ask them their definition of cyber, because by putting that together and understanding, you know, uh, so many people are oh we're all cyber practitioners, we don't have to define the definition of cyber. I said okay, well that's cool. Well I'm going to take this definition of cyber that everyone has apparently already agreed to. I'm going to write it up on the board, and then because everyone's going to have agreed to it, right? And then I so I write it up there, and then not, you know 50 percent of the crowd says no 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 that's not cyber. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, that's what I'm going entering this conversation with. So anytime you say cyber, that's what's in my head. So what's in your head to actually have this conversation about cyber? What does it include? What does it not include? And so a lot of what this was, this activity for this presentation, was trying to get a common definition for where I was working on cyber so we could have the cogent conversations and weren't talking past each other. And that was, again, one of the findings for discrete versus persistent from that cyber wargaming and analytics workshop was these people who actually all agreed predominantly to the definition were still talking past each other when they were talking about effects or tactics. And that fell between the discrete versus persistent, which was an interesting one. Yeah, and I think the, uh, you know, I've kind of always looked at that uh, kind of, uh, situation is trying to get people onto the same wavelength because 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 like you said you know you had the experience there where you know folks were just kind of talking past each other and you know if you're if you're not on the same wavelength you know you're not going to uh, you're, not, you're really not going to have much luck in uh, getting getting anything accomplished so so it's critical critical that people are speaking the same language same language you know they have the you know you know, when you're saying something that you know you you both know it, it means the same thing, and and uh, what what effect you know what effect that's going to have on the uh, on the situation. So that's uh, yeah, that, is, that is crucial. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back quite a few sides because one of the compounding things, and this is where I would recommend anybody talk about this, is you have a lot of different definitions as we're demonstrating here right? This is just within the DOD, is each one of these groups, Army Cyber, 10th Fleet, 24th Air Force, Cyber Command, Missile Defense Agency, all of these groups have slightly different definitions, visions, and missions. And the interesting thing is, depending on how people hone in on those differences, it can actually dramatically change the vector by which you pursue cyber. So, trying this was that was the issue that we had um again back at Raytheon was people would read the one direction and they would go hone in on it and say well we're going this way and you're like no 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 bring it back bring it back bring it back um and another cool thing that we did is so we took the dis distilled definition and the what we call the relative importance of these different terms and then we took this list of elements and we had our own internal cyber practitioners rank them by how important they thought these were. And it was interesting to see the alignment or lack of alignment on different elements, um, which was useful to go back and say, hey, you're all saying you're doing these things, but you're not actually aligning with the majority of the DOD in this one, or you're doing really well here, um, but you're missing this element sort of thing. Does that really help get people mm. internally on the same page? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, yeah. It's very important. I, I think, like you said, I mean, if they have a different a different understanding, uh, you know, as they they read the direction, but if they under, understand it or interpret it differently, they are going to go off in a different direction, and it may not, you know, align. So it, it is it is crucial to get get folks. Uh, you know, lining things up like that. So, all right. Well, uh, let pending me any other any, questions? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I was, that's I was just going to ask the same oh, thing. Fair. I was just going to do a shout out to the audience to see if there are 
any other any other questions for for Michael while you've got him on the line here? And uh, if not, I I want to thank you for uh, taking the, the time to uh, share this information with us. I, I think this research is you know really really important. I, I think. Uh, you know, I, I think as you flesh this out, and hopefully we can share share more of the information with the the community. You know, maybe you could uh, uh, you know do a journal article or something of this nature, and you know we could we could uh, include it in one of our quarterly journals and and share that with our with our audience members. You know, where you could you know get into you know more detail and and uh, do kind of a deeper dive into the topic. I think that would be. Uh, you know that that would be good if we something we can uh, work out in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to put my email um, in the comments here, so that uh, by all means, feel free to um, to email me. Um, I'm part of the Moore's uh, Working Group Five, which is Information and Cyber Operations, along with Working Group Thirty Five, which is Autonomous Systems and AI. So kind of working in both those realms, trying to blend them together a little bit. So um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I'm always interested in, in talking and really expanding my knowledge base as well. So any ads that you could provide would be absolutely wonderfully accepted for these uh, these conversations. So. Okay, that sounds great. So if anybody's got any anything they'd like to uh uh, share with Michael or vice, you know, you got questions for him. There's his uh, contact info, and you feel free to uh, reach out to him, or you can always reach us at info at csiac.org. And, uh, you know, if you um, want to go that route, we'll make sure we get the uh, we'll get the information to uh, to Michael for his uh, for his review. So, once again, Michael, uh, thank you for taking the time and sharing the. Uh, the information with us and I'd like to thank all our attendees for uh, joining us today and we look forward to uh, seeing you at a future uh, webinar.